Open your Bibles with me this morning to the book of 1 Peter, the epistle, the letter of 1 Peter. And if you don't have a copy of scripture with you, of course we have some uh, that you can borrow under the chair in front of you or under the row in front of you, spaced out, help yourself. That's the same translation I'll be preaching from this morning. And as you're turning there, I just want to say on a personal level that um, if you still haven't been able to stop by and look at the books that were just given away, um, I've cleaned out my library somewhat about two weeks ago. Um, those books are available all day today in the fellowship hall on that table, and then it'll be a short walk from there to the dumpster um, or to a, perhaps a donation point. Um, but help yourself. Don't be modest. Take as many as you want. You can take all three boxes and put them in your car, and I'd thank you. Um, so there's devotional stuff in there. There's technical journals in there. And uh, help yourself, please. That'll be the last. I'll, well, I'll say something tonight, too, but that'll be it then. Well, from what I understand, we're in spring break now for many of the schools, be it schools local here, um, grade schools, high schools, junior highs. I know some colleges are on spring break this coming week. Some were on spring break this past week as well. But it gets us all thinking a little bit, all of us old people, thinking a little bit and reminiscing a little bit about our time in school. Remember going to school? Remember how you loved spring break getting out of school? And uh, we can share in their excitement. I, I, I've been thinking about school and high school this week, thinking about spring break. And there were always classes I loved and there were classes that I loathed. Maybe you can relate to me. I always enjoyed, um, if I had to go to school, I might as well take some a class that interested me. And I always enjoyed, I loved drafting class. My Christian school had two years of drafting training. Um, I enjoyed art class. We had a retired professional cartoonist teach for one year at our Christian high school. And I uh, loved that. I enjoyed, of course, PE class. Yes, recess for high school. Um, I enjoyed some of the science classes. Anything touching on earth science or astronomy, I enjoyed that. And for some reason, I know you have a hard time believing this, but for some weird reason, I liked speech class because I was supposed to talk and get a grade for it, right? But man, I loathed some classes. I did not like math classes. I did okay in them, but I didn't enjoy them. And I didn't like I like some science classes, but where math and science come together, as I would say, I didn't enjoy physics class. I didn't enjoy physics. Amen, said the engineer in our midst. Okay. I, I, uh, I, I, enjoyed, I didn't enjoy physics and math for one main reason. For some reason, I just didn't get into story problems. I didn't enjoy them. I couldn't enter into them and, and didn't get a lot of them right. Story problems for me were... A problem. But I'm thinking of this concept of story problems. I'm, I'm, it brings my mind to our text this morning in 1 Peter chapter 4. Because what Peter is going to do in verses 12 through 19, and what he has been doing leading up to this passage, is he has been laying out some story problems for us. And our challenge this morning as we go into verses 12 through 19 is to put ourselves into a few story problems. And these are the same story problems that Peter's readers, his first initial readers, found themselves in. Now we're deep into this epistle. Actually, there's just a few sermons left and, and we finish this epistle. But we've seen on our journey through these, uh, uh, these opening chapters all the way to the deep point of chapter 4, we've been seeing what they've been suffering. And what's the suffering that's involved in the story problems here? It's cultural slander. They were experiencing it, and I think we can relate to them. But not just cultural slander. There were governmental threats. Seems like we can relate to that one as well. There, were, there was employer bias. They were facing that. And there was even family heat where the gospel came to town, so to speak, 
Not all the husbands or not all the wives always got saved, at least up to this point. And I think as we watch them go through their story problem, if you will, facing cultural slander, governmental threats, employer bias, bias, and family heat, we can definitely relate to them. You know, when it comes to cultural slander, we have a media today in 2024 that relentlessly defines you and me as Christ followers as being nothing more than a hater. They use words like bigot or something phobic and say that we have no concern for the poor. They call us haters. Our media and our culture also calls us, if we hold to the Bible as our authority, They call us simpletons. They say we don't pay attention to the science. They do what they want with creation. And even when it comes to encouraging each other's hearts in spiritual matters, we are mocked because we find our answers solely in Scripture. We're called simpletons and haters. And we're also called by our media and our culture outsiders. We're not accepted. We don't fit into the revisionist history that's being written. And we don't pay attention to science, they say. So we, we can kind of relate to the cultural slander one. What about the government? The governmental threats, do we face those? Oh yes, we, we face even in 2024 threats from our government to the loss of three freedoms. The loss of financial freedom, even as a church, threats against losing tax-exempt status but also the loss of self-defense freedom through litigation regarding the Second Amendment, and we also face loss of worship freedom. We saw that somewhat in the pandemic. depends on where you were in the country as to the the manifestation of it. But we we have to look no further than across the Pacific Ocean to see where we're heading. Look in places like China, North Korea, or you can go to the 1040 window in a Muslim country. That's all today. We can relate to this. You say, what about employer bias? Well, I think we can relate to that as well. It might be an issue that you're passed over for a promotion, or you're run over by a critic, or it's game over for you, a layoff or even the loss of a job. I know many of you are facing that, even locally here, in your jobs. You're not using right pronouns. What about family heat? Well, we can all give testimony to this hitting close to home, where one or more family members have resisted the gospel up to this point, or at some, earlier at some point they claimed to be Christians, but time has revealed that they were not ever regenerated, and they re- not only reject the faith, but they now react to your faith and even assail your faith. Yeah, this story problem, these story problems that Peter's initial readers are facing, we can relate to them. And you know, when we find ourselves in any of these um, reactions from the God-hating culture against us, whether it's culturally or government or employer or family, we usually have a lot of questions about that suffering when it's going on, when it gets thick. We ask questions like this in our suffering, why me? Or we ask questions like this, where is God? Sometimes when we're suffering as Christ followers, we ask this question, how could he, God, allow this? Or we might ask this question, is this fair? Or we might ask, will I ever be happy again? Or we ask this question, What am I supposed to do? These are heartfelt questions that come out of hurting hearts. But for us Christians, when we're suffering because we're Christians, are these the right questions for us to be asking? Are they the best questions? And I want to suggest to you that our our paragraph we're going to look at, verses 12 through 19 this morning, provides us with the six best questions, the six right questions for you and for I to ask. 
when we are suffering as Christ followers? In any of these venues and to whatever degree? Six questions. First of all, the first question is what we'll call the question of purpose. A question of purpose. What is this question concerned with? It asks this question, do I remember why? Do I remember why I'm suffering as a Christ follower? It's not a matter of if we're going to suffer, but why we suffer. Your Bibles are open to chapter 4. Look at verse 12. Beloved, and by the way, stop there. What does that mean? Is that merely filler? Is that just merely Peter quoting his throat? Or quoting his throat, clearing his throat. We've got to get this out of my system early in this sermon. Is it merely Peter clearing his throat so he can say something? Is he gathering his thoughts? No, that's a very busy word. At this point in the epistle, Peter has already used this word, beloved. It's a precious word. You get your word agape. Agape, agape tas is this word. You are significantly loved. So it begs the question, by whom? It's by God himself. In chapter 1, verse 1, though the word love is not here, the concept and the, 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 the milieu of, of affection of God for you is clear. Verse 2, according to the, you are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be yours in the fullest. What are we talking about here? We're talking about the fact that God has placed his saving affections on you. And every member of the Trinity is involved. You are beloved. And he's used this same word earlier in the epistle that we see here in chapter 4, verse 12. Beloved. Now, look at this verse. Beloved. Do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. This is the question of purpose. Do I remember why I'm suffering? Why as the beloved of God am I in a place where I am suffering? I'm being persecuted. I'm being rejected. I'm being marginalized. I'm being canceled all because I'm faithful to Jesus Christ. Do I remember why this happens? And, and, and you don't really see it here in the English, but I want to just point out something uh, in, from the, the Greek. It says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you. That little phrase literally in the word order in the Greek is the among you burning. It's like you're on fire. There's an intensity to this. And it's here that we need to be reminded that Christian suffering at the hands of skeptics is not merely a possibility. Peter's never said it's just a possibility. It is guaranteed. He's been talking like this leading up to this point. And three times in this paragraph alone, in verse 12, and we'll see it in verse 17, as well as in verse 19, we are told that we are going to suffer. And just remember what he said back in chapter 3, verse 17. For it is better if God should will it so that you suffer for doing what is right rather than for doing what is wrong. It's guaranteed that you and I will suffer. There's an important principle that we need to lay hold of in verse 12. And it's this principle. Nothing happens by chance. Nothing happens under the radar of God's providence. He told us we're going to suffer. He told us through the pen of the Apostle Paul, all those who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer. Paul put it this way in Philippians 1.29, it's not only been granted to you for you to believe, but also to suffer. Not one aspect, not one swing from our culture or our government 
or an employer or even a loved family member is a surprise. It's not a surprise to God. It's not a surprise to us. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the great British preacher, put it this thing this way. Everything that has moved or shall move in heaven and earth and hell has been, is, and shall be according to the counsel and foreknowledge of God, fulfilling a holy, just, wise, and unalterable purpose. It's not an accident. Do you remember why we are suffering? Why you are suffering? This is the question to ask when you are suffering. You start here. Look at the verse again. Which comes upon you, this fiery ordeal, this burning among you, comes upon you for your testing. Right there we have the purpose of suffering that God allows us to go through. It's for our testing. It's to prove us. It's to test us. This particular Greek word means uh, to, to, to put to a test in order to see what comes out. In order to see what's real, what's left. It's the same word that we'll find even in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. You want to see the outcome. Why? Are you saying that I have to suffer as a Christ follower in order for my faith to be shown as amazingly stable so that people will marvel at me and back off? No, 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 no. This whole thing is not about you. This is a faith that you've been given by God and God wants to put the faith he's given to you on display. And how indestructible it is. You see, it's like this. Um, Those of you who are old enough to remember when the iPhone first rolled out from Steve Jobs. To the present day iPhone, if you have iPhones. You would marvel at what the iPhone could do, not only way back then, but especially now. And you wouldn't praise the phone, ultimately. The more you were impressed with the technology behind the iPhone, the more your mind went to Apple and to Steve Jobs, through which we get the iPhone. You see, it's the the amazing mind behind what we're marveling at that gets the glory. And it's the same with you. You have people relentlessly, either in media or in your daily moments, just constantly reminding you that you're a Christ follower and you're just just not up to speed, man. We actually don't trust you because you're a Christ follower. We make life a little more difficult for you intentionally or passively, but there's a circle on the floor, you're standing in it, and that means you're not one of us. What is that? What is God doing? As we have been learning in our study through 1 Peter, there is, a, there is the very power of God at work in us as his chosen vessels. So that when people see us and they see our resilience stamped with grace, animated by the gospel, When they see our resilience, they don't go, oh, wow, well, Jim's sure standing up underneath this pressure we're putting on him. That's not the end game. The end game is for Jim to be tested so that the resilience that comes out points to the reality of God and his glory. It's a question of purpose. Do I remember why I'm suffering? It's for my testing so that the faith he's given to me, he's given to you, will be shown to be monumental and indestructible. That's why you must suffer. That's the first question. Question number two is what we'll call the question of focus. The question of focus. What is this? What's this question? This question goes like this. How can I rejoice in the midst of this suffering? How can I rejoice? Look at verse 13. 
but to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ. In other words, whether just a little bit of suffering or a lot of suffering. Wherever you end up on any scale on any particular day, a little or a lot, to the degree that you share uh, the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing so that also at the revelation of his glory you may rejoice with exaltation. How in this suffering? How specifically, how concretely can I rejoice? This verse doesn't suggest rejoicing as merely an option on the buffet. It's not suggesting that rejoicing when you're getting crushed by unbelievers at the very level of your heart, if not your body. It's not the suggestion that, yeah, rejoicing's an option. It's up there right next to the Advil. Take your pick. Rejoicing is a sure destination we must arrive at. So we need to press on this a little bit. What, is he, what do you mean, keep on rejoicing so that also at the revelation of his glory you may rejoice with exaltation? Is this merely the call to being a bulldozer Christian, as I say? You set your jaw, remove your smile, wrinkle your forehead, and just say, well, I'm just going to gut this one out. Is this a call for a stoic chin? No, it's not. This isn't a call for you to be a hypocrite. You know, when I was in Virginia Beach, it was interesting to see the stories, the different stories that God was writing in many different lives and families who would uproot their families and move to Virginia Beach where it wasn't cheap to live. And they would do that just to be part of Colonial Baptist Church and enroll in Virginia Beach Theological Seminary. Lots of different stories from all over the world. And every story was special. But there's one story I remember of a, a medical doctor, my age, who, uh, he came to visit the campus of the seminary, and I was invited to be part of the, the meeting, the faculty uh, representative for his family, just to talk to them about seminary, and ask questions, ask, ask and answer questions and uh, have a meal with them. And here's a medical doctor, already deep into a career, a successful medical career, bringing his five or six children um, to study seminary because they wanted to go into medical missions. And I got to know this family quite well. They ended up moving to us, and I had this doc medical doctor in class in the seminary classroom and appreciated his integrity, appreciated his focus and just always watched him. He's a medical doctor who steps out of that career because he wanted to go into medical missions. They ended up buying a house in the neighborhood across the street from the church and they could literally walk to church if they wanted. And, uh, and, the, and they just kind of settled into the scenery. They were just in the student body. They were serving hard in the church. And one day, we got just an awful phone call. It's the kind you never want to get. The kind that says, pastors, can you, can you come to the house right now? Sure. So we go to the house, and it was a tragic unfolding of events. A neighbor was backing out of their driveway and ran over their four-year-old son. Three, four years old in the street, just, and, 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 and the senior pastor had, had gone to the hospital with mom and dad and was at the hospital when their son eventually passed. Needless to say, I spent a lot of time at the house with the family in the, in the coming days and even helped with the funeral. Um, being a police chaplain helped me get some quick access when there were a lot of emergency vehicles around. I was in the house just weeping with them and 
trying to minister to them and their kids. It was very difficult. Can you imagine that? Even had the opportunity to watch the mom and dad, the doctor and his wife, go with me, and they requested this. Would you go with us to our neighbor's house? This is a few days after. Because we want to make sure he's okay. Were you with me on that visit? I don't remember. And so I said, of course, we'll go with you over there. We went over to the house, and the man was just crestfallen when he answered the door. And, and when we asked if we could come in, he was like, why, of course. And he had had some misfortunes in life prior to this, and this only capped it off. And I watched, I watched this mom and dad with broken hearts fresh hugging this man who was weeping. They knew him as their neighbor. And now they're just holding him as he's shaking and weeping. And they're weeping too. And him fumbling for words to say, I'm sorry, and them just saying, we forgive you. There's, are you okay? And to see more care shown for him in those moments. You say, what is that? That's a grace that um, you, you, you just can't believe until you see it. I I was talking some, to some of the other police officers that were there, and they made a comment to me that they can't understand how this family who has lost so much, so suddenly, is so quick to reflect a joy. And I was able to talk with the police officers about what's behind that joy. It's not a sick joy that is energized by pain. It's a joy believing that God is over all and in control. And when I suffer in this life, it allows me, as, P as Paul said in Philippians, to share in the sufferings of Christ. And not that there was anything lacking in what Christ suffered and we have to fill in the gaps. No, his suffering was perfect and full. But it's the fact that he suffered. And time, from time to time in this life, I get, to, I get to feel a suffering as a believer. Maybe because of persecution or because of difficulty. And a persecuting world looks in. And they see a joy that doesn't make sense. This word, rejoice, keep on rejoicing. We get from that same root, the word joy. The fruit of the Spirit. The exact word that you see in Galatians 5.22. The fruit of the Spirit is not a happiness that's based on circumstances. It's a deep-seated contentment and joy based on spiritual realities of Christ and me. The work that Christ has done in me. And it's being fixated on those to such a degree that circumstances can't shake those realities. That's my joy. And so I find it interesting whether you're suffering a little, it says to whatever degree, or a great amount. It's going to affect your joy in that you are feeling and experiencing the pain of the one who loved you so and came to rescue you. He says here, what is the rejoicing connected to? Look at verse 13. So that also at the revelation of his glory you may rejoice with exaltation. Earlier in the verse it talks about the sufferings of Christ and the return of Christ. You say, what exactly about Christ is it that keeps me rejoicing? When I go through these personal trials or when I'm being even persecuted as a Christ follower. What is it about Christ that I fixate on? Two things. First of all, it's a relating with Christ, as I said that I may know the, the, be involved in the fellowship of his sufferings. Philippians 3, verses 7 through 11 is that text. But it's not just relating with Christ. And by the way, that word share, 
sharing in the sufferings of Christ is a word, a Greek word that you've heard before. It's koinonia, koinonia. Uh, koinoneo is the verb form, and this is what it's talking about. You are, there's, a, there's a oneness, a sharing between you and Christ in that pain. But it's not just relating with Christ, but it's looking for Christ. The revelation of his glory. You know, I, I think of this back in chapter 1 of 1 Peter. Chapter 1, verse 6. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Peter is fixated on the coming of Jesus, the future coming when we will be with him triumphantly. That's what you fixate on. And no matter what you are experiencing, no matter what you are suffering, the fact that Christ can relate. And Christ is coming. That is what will propel your joy forward. How can I rejoice? It's a question of focus. What's another question you are to ask when you're suffering? Number three, a question of resilience. A question of re resilience. What does this one say? This question says, can I endure Am I going to make it through this? Whether it's a tragedy living in a fallen world or whether it's a, a fallen world persecuting and marginalizing and canceling you. Can I endure this? Look at verse 14 for the answer. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed. In other words, remember what that Greek word means? You are in a place to be envied. Why? Because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. There is a general endurance that the Holy Spirit works in each genuine believer to endure the difficulties of living in a fallen world and living it out in a, in a in, in, being incarcerated in unredeemed humanity, as MacArthur says, the flesh and our battle with the flesh. There is a general, powerful endurance at work in every believer towards that end. And it's really powerful, very present, and amazingly awesome. But what Peter's saying here in verse 13 is that sometimes you'll even get this. There's going to be turbo, which you only use when you've got to pass another car. Uh, Peter here is describing something, promising something to those who might even pay the ultimate sacrifice of giving their lives in this persecution. I mean, there's the general presence and resources of Christ in us that helps us endure. And the fruit of the Spirit would be an example of that. But there's something here that if you're facing the ultimate, you're going to find in those ultimate moments the next level grace for endurance. And I love the wording here. It's the spirit of glory and of God resting on you in those moments. Sometimes you and I watch other believers go through such a deep level of suffering, such an intensity of pain, in some cases, persecution and even death. And, and we have to admit, we've never been through that. How in the world did they endure and finish well? Because of this spirit of glory and of God resting on them in those moments of extremity. Until you and I get to those moments, what we have is sufficient and wonderful. But the promise is, when it's time for us to go to that level of suffering, there will be a grace waiting for us. 
that we didn't need until then. I remember my senior year of, excuse me, my junior year of college, I was asked to be a, um, a, a, floor, a floor monitor or whatever they called it. I had 72 guys that I was responsible for on, in one of the dorms. And yeah, it, was, it, was, um, it wasn't fun, <laughs> uh, but it, I got to stay up later than they did. And there was one guy in my hall that I just instantly connected with. He was a year younger than I was. His name was Dan. Dan is actually um, a college professor now in the same school. But I remember meeting Dan early that year and finding out that his dad had just died few weeks before the school year. I'm like, wow. I wouldn't have picked Dan out from the crowd to be the one whose dad just recently died. Why? Because Dan was full of joy. He was constantly moving towards other people to be an encouragement. And so I remember, I remember staying up late with him one night. I said, Dad, I need to talk to you. I said, I don't, what's that like to lose your dad? Um, you're, you're younger than me, and I, I can't fathom losing my dad. What's that like? And he just told me the story of, yeah, it's hard, and there's, there are many tears, and the first round of holidays are the worst. And he says, but, and then and everything went right back to God, how God was present. His word read like the morning news. And he just, he went on, and, 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 and I was just listening to him saying, that's just blowing my mind. I've never experienced that. You have, so I'm listening to you. But two years later, my dad died. Over Christmas break. Christmas morning, actually. 1989. And I went through that Christmas break. Of course, we buried dad and had to just go through all that as a family. Then I went back to school. I was in grad school at that time. Guess who's the first person I looked up when I got back to school? Dan. I said, Dan, now I, I want to talk again. Because what you told me was true. You couldn't put it into words. You just kept trying to describe it from different angles, but it was true. I had never experienced it before because I'd never lost a dad before. But when I lost mine, yeah, I can't put it into words. I didn't point at it and describe it and and, and reflect on it, but it's, I just can't describe there was an amazing peace and this joy that I had never experienced before because I'd never been through it before, see. And Dan said, that's it. That's it. The question of resilience, can I endure? The answer is yes. You don't get this next layer until it's time and until you're facing something you've never faced before. And at that time, you'll have the spirit of grace and of God rest on you. Many believe that Isaiah 11, verses 1 through 3, is being quoted here by Peter. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, talking about Jesus, the coming Messiah. But what sweet language Peter reaches for from that passage to say that spirit will see you through. we got three questions left and not much time. The fourth question to ask when you are in persecution is a question of integrity. A question of integrity. This question goes something like this. When you're suffering... You need to ask this question, have I sinned? Have I sinned? I mean, the truth is, brothers and sisters, you and I, even as the redeemed, we are still wired to react, aren't we? That's our instinct. Look at verses 15 to 16. Make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer or thief or evildoer or a troublesome meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this name. Isn't it an interesting list in those two verses? If we are reviled, I mean, this is an outright assault on us because we're Christ followers. 
If we're reviled for the name, our identification with his name, then make sure that we are not suffering as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or someone who gets into other people's business. That's what that Greek word means. Interesting list. A murderer is a hater. A thief is a covetous person. An evildoer is simply someone whose every contribution has a worthless impact for good. And then troublesome meddler is just a busybody. You say, what fuels those kind of reactions? Well, you saw it in verse 16. If anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be, and look at this word, ashamed. You know what? When you and I are rejected, when we aren't respected, we, it's our pride that rise, raises its head, fueled by not wanting to be ashamed, and we lash out and try to harm the person or the institution that's doing this to us. We hate them, we become covetous, and we engage in a worthless way for anything good, and our tongue cuts loose. We put our mind or our screens into their business, and we try to harm them. As I said, even for the redeemed, we are wired to react. But there's a problem with that. When we do that, we do not do the end of verse 16. We do not glorify God as his followers. You understand that when someone wrongs you, and we're talking primarily persecutors, but this can happen in the church too. If we do it with persecutors, we do it with people in the family of God too. When someone, wrong, someone truly wrongs us and we react and get into their stuff. We step in front of God. And all they see is us. April 8th is a big day coming up. We have a total solar eclipse. This will be the first full solar eclipse for Michigan in 70 years. It will be on April 8th. It will start approximately at 1.58 p.m., and will reach maximum total eclipse around 3.14 p.m. and conclude around 4.27 p.m. The best place to see it and, ha and still be in Michigan is the very most southeast corner of our state by the lake. You want to be right down there. And that's where the path is going to go over our state. And you say, what is a total solar eclipse? It's just that the moon comes into the picture and the heart of the day stands in front of the sun. And it's going to feel like it's night. Might even, temperature might even be affected for a few minutes. I don't ever want you to forget April 8 and this question. Because when you and I react sinfully against those who wrong us, all that's seen is a cold darkness of our own heart. We eclipse the glory of God. We have to ask the question when we're being persecuted. Have I sinned in response to this or even to bring it on? Hmm. Number four protects you from making your persecution all about you. There's a fifth question. It's the question of perspective. The question of perspective. And this answers... Could it be worse? Remember, when you're hurting, this is a question you ask. Could it be worse? The answer, of course, is yes. I've had, a, I've had a practice during March Madness every year that has gotten me in trouble with a lot of Michigan people. I cheer for University of Michigan. Anytime they're playing anyone, just get that out in the open. It's been that way my whole life. But if they're not in it, if they're not in the game, my next default setting is to cheer for the Big Ten team that's playing. I want our conference to excel. Um, so last night there was a game on Michigan State University playing UNC in basketball, University of North Carolina. It was a good fight for a good part of the game, but then UNC pulled away and won and eliminated Michigan State University. So 
our basketball players from MSU are getting up this morning discouraged, probably sad, reliving a thousand moments from that game. But I want to say to them, it could be worse. You could be the University of Michigan this year. You know, that's what Peter's saying to suffering believers. It could be worse. Keep that in mind. Look at verses 17 and 18. For it's time for the judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? If it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? Interesting phrase there, those who do not obey the gospel of God. That's Peter's overt way of saying unsaved people. These are people who are not saved. They're not Christians. They are lost. We've seen that in chapter 2 of this epistle. We've seen it in chapter 3. Even Paul used this language that um, he, he, he is marveling at the obedience of faith among the Gentiles, meaning when someone comes to faith, there is, a, there is, a, there is obedience that describes them, a, a new direction for their life. If there's not a new direction, if there's no obedience, the person is lost. If there's no change and they're, no, they're not a, a new creation, there's no life. Peter's saying here in verses 17 and 18, you're suffering and it's hurting now, yes, but it could be worse. If God's refining us and he's starting with us, do you have any idea how awful and terrible it will be for those that continue to reject God, the very people who are persecuting you, when they face God himself in judgment? I wonder if you're ready to face your judge. Has there been a point in your life where you have stopped marveling at Christians just as being, wow, they're very religious, and you've seen that it's a relationship, it's real. These people are living life consistently with the reality that their sins are forgiven, they've been reconciled to God, they are walking with God, God indwells them, and they are marching triumphantly to the future and to the very presence of God, all because of God's doing. And you've admitted that's not your story up to this point. And brother or sister, my friend, I should say, I want you to become my brother or my sister in Christ by repenting of your sin and placing your faith in the same Jesus I've placed my faith into. The one who, who suffered because of my sin and he rose again. I call him Lord. And you can too. You will face Jesus someday. If you become a Christian, you're going to suffer. I'm going to be up front with you as Christ was. You're going to suffer. But it's nothing compared with what will happen when you face Jesus in the future as your judge. You either face him now as your savior or you'll stand before him as your judge. There's one question left. The question of obedience. Look at verse 19. Therefore, those also who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. I agree with the study Bible some of you have open in front of you. The ESV study Bible says this verse encapsulates the entire message of 1 Peter. It's like Peter's been saying everything he's been saying so he can say verse 19. And then he's going to start saying goodbye after this verse. He says, let us also um, suffer according to the will of God. We, uh, we entrust our souls. I love this wording. To a faithful creator. Entrust here is an accounting term. In other words, we're like, it's yours, Lord. It doesn't belong to me, it's yours. It's, this is yours. My life is yours. My suffering and where I hurt is yours. This is your kind will that I walk this difficult road in this moment in time, knowing that I will 
be with you for all eternity. I entrust my soul to you when my body is being crushed. But I'm captured with the name used here. Entrust their souls to a faithful creator. A faithful creator. Huh. You need to bring these two concepts together. Trust and your creator. You say, well, that creator means that he made the world and the heavens and the earth and all that. Yes. But also remember that in the New Testament, we read language, for example, in Ephesians 4 and Colossians 3, that there's a new creation of us happening. As redeemed people, we are being conformed to the image of him who has rescued us, who has redeemed us. He is conforming us to his own image his own Christ-likeness. And so, Lord, I'm going to trust you as you continue your good work of transforming me into the image of your Son. I'm going to trust you. And I want to demonstrate that trust. This is a question of obedience. Where can I express trust? If I'm trusting you, in my suffering, then I am going to actively look for ways to demonstrate that trust. And it's going to be obedience. It will always be obedience. Obedience is the expression of trust. So you look around your story problem for opportunities during the pain of rejection as a Christ follower. During those moments, during those weeks, during those seasons... You aggressively look around your story problem for opportunities to demonstrate trust, love, and loyalty through your obedience. Those are six questions. Six questions to ask when you're suffering as a Christ follower. Be it the culture, be it the government, be it your employment, be it family. St. Augustine once wrote, God had one son on earth without sin, but never one without suffering. And someone else put it this way, it is the crushed grape that yields the sweetest wine. Maybe when you and I are wronged, whether it's actual or perceived, whether it's by the lost or even by another Christian, Perhaps our homework assignment should be to stop reaching for our history notes or scorecards. Instead, reach for 1 Peter 4, 12 through 19 and your journal. And write these six questions down and answer them. Answer them. What are the right questions to ask in suffering? Simply these. Do I remember why I'm suffering? How can I rejoice in this suffering? Can I endure this suffering? Have I sinned in the midst of this suffering? Could this suffering be worse? And where can I express my trust right now? Father, thank you for bringing us to this point in our journey through this beloved epistle of Peter. A man who at one point answered all six questions wrong. And yet now, by your grace, he teaches us how to answer them correctly. We don't know what's coming here in the West. We have hints. We have hints. And there's some dark moments already here and some discouraging craters. But we're up for it, Lord. Because of that spirit of grace and glory. Thank you for your kindness to us in Jesus' name.